My name is Aram, and my pronouns are he, him. I'm the producer of the Dungeon & Dragons podcast, God's Fall. My name is Dylan. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a physicist from Canada. Welcome to Kill, Kill Every, Every Monster. Monster. This week on Kill Every Monster, we are featuring giant insects. The Monster Manual lists a variety of giant insects, including giant wasps, spiders, and centipedes. They act and function as they would normally, despite their increased bulk. In this episode, we are joined by Jesse Dahan. Jesse is a research technician studying insect pests and their predators in greenhouses and agriculture. They are also the host and producer of the SciComm podcast, Gamer's Guide to Ecology, which aims to teach the ecological principles found in open world video games to the people that play and love them. Not everyone has the chance to grow up surrounded by nature or learn about it. Through the common media of video games, Jesse hopes to teach people about the current topics that affect our own natural world, like climate change, pollution, and habitat loss. Welcome to the show, Jesse. Thank you for having me. I love it when we get to pull actual experts on for things yeah people who know stuff <laughs> especially because quite frankly the, the books don't give you anything for running insects there's no indication of like where they live what their behavior is it, you know it gives you like a large or small beast that's all you get to go on jesse god how do you even word that jesse what are what are giant insects they're insects but they're large. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Thank you for joining us for Kill Every Monster. Check out our Patreon. At <laughs> In the Dungeon Master's Guide, um, there are a number of giant arthropods. Most of what people think are insects are not actually. So scorpions and spiders and things are arthropods, but they're not insects. Same with centipedes. Basically, the only large, the only giant insect in the Dungeon Master's Guide is the giant wasp. That limits your options when you want to play giant insects. So moving to arthropods, you know, you have giant crabs, giant spiders, things like that. Crabs and spiders are the same thing? Insects have six legs and usually a pair of wings to go with it. So they have eight appendages. And arachnids have eight appendages. None of which are wings. Exactly. And then you get into things like millipedes and centipedes, and you're just like, well, that is too many legs. Although I think millipedes are really cute. The centipedes are too much. The legs are too much. But I, I get it with the millipedes. I'm not, I don't agree with you, but I see where you're coming from. They're like pill bugs. You know, those little roly poly bugs. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's like a long pill bug. Yep. Yeah, yeah. But you've like, you've done the panoramic shot and the pill bug gets caught in the panoramic shot, you know, and he just segments get added to it. <laughs> right. People like things that are cute, right? So. Millipedes eat decomposing plant matter and material, but centipedes are carnivores. They are hunters, they have poison, they're a little bit scarier, pointy looking, jagged, you know, sharp fangs. Their claws look a little bit more scary if you think of like a alien sort of creature that got stretched with God's iPhone again, <laughs> but scary version. <laughs> He's like, make another one, but mean. Can you give like just some vague classes then? Because the the D, the monster manual, as you mentioned, gives you nothing for running on these. Are there sort of some sort of, I guess, vague categories that you can give for insect behaviors that might be useful to a DM? The first thing that comes to mind is um, social versus solitary. The majority of insects are solitary. They live on their own. You know, if they if they hunt uh, for like, you know, other bugs, uh, they do that by themselves. Classic social insects that people think of are like ants and termites and bees and wasps. Not all bees are, sol are social, most of them are solitary, um, but when you think of like the bumblebee or the honeybee, you think of hives that have like hundreds and thousands of individuals in them, at least in the case of honeybees. The next way that you could group them, I think would be based on their environment that they live in. 
moving past the the whole like is a scorpion an insect thing i'll just forget about that from now on and talk about them as they're giant insects we'll move on to the general <laughs> colloquial definition of just yes. bugs yeah okay anything well, creepy and crawly is bugs at the risk of sounding even more nerdy um, within insects there is a specific type of insect that are called bugs so all bugs are insects but not all insects are bugs so some bugs live, you know, under plant material in the ground. Some live uh, in the in the tree canopy. Some live indoors in our houses. So if you're thinking about insect behavior and you you have to think about where they live and what type of environment they're going to be found in to give them realistic behavior. Yeah, because like if you're doing bugs that normally live in our homes and suddenly they're made giant, these creatures aren't going to change. They're going to act in the same way they acted before. So they'll just try and burrow into something larger. Whereas like a bug may have tried to live in your basement. Now it tries to live in the dungeon of the castle and that's causing problems. Like if you just relate it directly, you can give them motivation that's alien and therefore makes them really an interesting opponent. If you extrapolate to that dungeon scenario, as soon as the lights turn on, the bugs are going to scatter, right? They're going to go to the right. shadows. So you might see them for a split second. You know, you'll have to hunt them out. God, that's the worst. Oh. Because normally a DM would just be like, okay, the monster charges. But if you see a giant beetle for a second and you just, oh, and then it's gone because your torch flickered because you were so startled, that's much more terrifying. One of my favorite things to see like in movies or to run in D&D is when you have a big animal like that, you bring up the beetle. But if you had a dung beetle that was the size of a Volvo and you walk by with a torch, it will not look at you in all likelihood. Like it's doing stuff. It's just going to keep doing its stuff. And the fact that like you have these giant monsters effectively where you just walk by and they don't I don't give a shit. <laughs> I forgot about the fire beetle. Oh, the fire beetle? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, technically those are, beetles are insects too. So I should say there's two insects in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Yeah, but that one's a wizard. It spits fire for absolutely no reason. It's a Pokemon. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be that they that they thought about like, um, you know, fire fireflies and they were like, how can we make this a thing? And so why don't we just make it actual fire? Because that sounds cool. But like a big glowing bug is also cool. Just a big yeah. glowing, you know, womp, womp. That would be awesome. If you're doing a, a fairly like natural cavern encounter and you have giant fireflies and you make them aggressive for some reason, because I'm pretty sure fireflies also are herbivorous. I, I didn't look into that. Don't quote me on any of this. Editor's note. Firefly larvae eat snails, worms, and slugs, which they inject with a numbing chemical to disable while they consume them alive. Adult fireflies eat nectar, pollen, and other fireflies. So in addition to being carnivorous, they are also cannibalistic, but really cute when they light up. But if you have to fight these things, they glow because they have effectively glow goop for you around that's a scientific term too you could kill one of these things get coated in glow goop and then roll that forward into an encounter where the party needs to be stealthy oh. you want to scaffold your encounters right you come in and you give them like one that's been isolated you squish the bug it glows and you're like oh well it's filled with glow goop that's a good thing to know and then you put them in a situation where now that you know that i will use that to slap you in the face if you're not paying attention I think you can play with that too, like a glow stick. People can recharge them if you put them like in the sunlight. And so you think you got all the goop off and then you go outside and, and the goop residuals get charged up in the sun. And next time you go into a cavern, the exact same thing happens until your character like through the narrative actually forced, like it's forced to take a bath or something like that. Or cast prestidigitation on everyone, right? Yeah. It becomes one of those things where, like, the moment you learn it, the moment you solve it, we don't have to talk about it anymore because, yes, the wizard now knows and can just kind of snap his fingers and clean you as a person. But until then, it's fun. Yeah. Once they've learned that, like, let them just know that. Don't make them explicitly say, and then I clean them with <laughs> prestidigitation because that sucks. Don't be a dick. Don't trek every arrow. Yeah, give them wiggle room. 
Insects feel unique to me in the ability to make so many of them just big and there. Like they're not gonna bug you, no pun intended. <laughs> they just wanna exist and do their thing and they're gonna largely ignore you in their giant size. So you get all this kind of atmosphere like the glow bugs, like a millipede running past you, right? You just get this feeling for the world. In Jurassic Park, when they start out around all the herbivores and everything feels safe and like, wow, this is amazing. It is so cool. Look at that millipede. You know, he's just going to eat more dirt or whatever he does. <laughs> And he's running past yeah. you and there's giant moths and giant, you know, yeah. whatever flying in the sky. And then, you know, you make it to the center of the island where the centipedes live and where the more uh, dangerous bugs live, like, you know, spiders or scorpions or ones that will actually like hunt you down and like trap you. The first giant jumping spider you run into is going to be horrifying. Oh my gosh, yes. Picture the scene where a spider jumps out and grabs the uh, the beetle that's going by. You know, do a trapdoor spider or whatever. It's a silent scene, like there might be a musical sting. The moment you make that spider eight feet tall, we've hit a point where the exoskeleton has enough material to it to be loud. That entire world is going to be cacophonous and terrifying. It They do this thing in movies whenever there's large insects, um, well, spiders portrayed. So like in um, in that one famous wizard movie with all of the giant spiders in the forest. Yeah, the turf movie. Yeah, yeah. Bad people. <laughs> the movie itself, it's not so bad. Yeah, uh, no, lovely people involved <laughs> in the movie. Then the piece of shit who wrote the books. Yeah. If that was your childhood, you know, I'm with you there. I get it. I just refer to it as that movie now. You know, Lord of the Rings, there was a giant spider in it. They add that, like, uh, noise, you know? That little, like, scuttering, yeah. ice scurrying noise. <laughs> that makes everybody's hair stand on end. And I think they accomplish it well because insects do make noise when they move. We just can't hear it. So when they're large, it would be, like, skittering little grinding noises, their joints creaking. It would be scary. A lot of insects, to protect themselves from getting eaten by other bugs, usually have some kind of defensive chemical that they can emit. So I studied a bee that, when it was startled, would puke up this this yellow liquid that smelled like um, Lysol, like it was lemony. You pick up the toad, the toad pees on you. Like that defensive mechanism, I feel is really ubiquitous uh, for a lot of pr like prey creatures. There's this velvet worm. It's not it's not like a insect or anything, but it's this weird velvety looking worm that has these two emitters on its face that shoot um silk and goop out of its out of its face and it captures things that are flying by, so like moths or butterflies or like other a flying net? things. Not quite like a net, it's more like a like a slime gun. Wow. And it slimes it and then it drops to the ground, it gets stuck in the slime and then it goes to eat it. You gotta watch a YouTube video because it's pretty cool. I love this as a DM because a lot of these things are environmental. Like if you're going to do this stuff on a battle map, there are so many cool things you can do where like not not enough to be like, OK, this is going to hit you disadvantage on dexterity. You can, but leave it so they can still move around, then make them stick to anything they touch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like you got to the you got to the ground and like you haven't fallen over. So everything's fine. But you just got pushed up against the wall. You're stuck to a wall now. It sucks to be you. And that kind of brings it back to that like uh frodo in the lair you know uh, with the sting and the sword like trying to get through with all the webbing and stuff to set the to set the mood of like a cave or something there's a south american centipede that will hang from the top of a cave downward and bats flying by it will just catch one and eat a whole bat <laughs> Yeah, but if you had a giant one of those catching eagles... Or what are those sturges? You don't have to change the size to get sturges, but the other thing is the same sort of thing as the face spider, where if you want to extrapolate like how it behaves naturally to a magic world, make it go after familiars. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Have a spider that's attacking wizards and it's just grabbing a spectral owl and consuming that. 
Yeah, if you saw a party and they and it was a bunch of armored people and one little owl, you would pick off the weakest thing. You're going for the owl. Maybe that's it. Maybe phase spiders aren't their own species. Maybe it's a regular like giant spider that's just eating too much magic stuff. Feeding on the magic, yeah. I love that. Especially because they don't give you anything for phase spiders. Another thing with insects is that I think it really encourages the DM to layer the creatures. So these insects are interacting with all the other monsters. Maybe a giant spider goes after a goblin. Maybe there's a bunch of rocks that have to deal with an infestation of giant lice or whatever. You can really <laughs> tie the world into each other this way. Bird lice. I'm fair. Like That's not wrong, but also that's such a fucking absurd thing to say. There was a show I saw recently, I don't, I don't remember what it was, but they got on the main beast and the main beast had critters that lived in it. Of course, And they yeah. weren't ready for the critters, but I was like, that's really smart. Because of course that's how it would be. Like we have, we have mites crawling on us all the time. It's just, I'm sorry, listener, but it's true. <laughs> I, I know people get freaked out by that, but I like being a zoo. It's an ecosystem. You yourself are an ecosystem and that is cool. I think that's great. I am an island onto myself. You can't just say, and there are giant ants. If you have a colony of giant ants living under the kingdom, like, the kingdom's fucked now. <laughs> the giant tunnels that are going to occasionally collapse, the farms that are going to go desolate because, like... They are stealing cows and goats and your meat and cheese stores. Like, those are gone. Jesse, are insects monsters? No, I don't think so. They are creatures that require certain things to live and if that thing is you because you're walking by it's you classically speaking people regard insects as scary things um, it's like an inborn reaction that people have um, to be afraid of things that they don't understand Creepy crawly things like spiders, centipedes, especially house centipedes. Those things look creepy. People are afraid of them, right? Um, but if you just let it do its thing, it doesn't bother you. You don't bother it. You live together in your house and it will actually eat mosquitoes and spiders and stuff that it finds. People out there have fear of spiders and insects and bugs in general. They don't like touching them. They don't like seeing them. So if you were to ask other people, they might say insects are monsters. But typically, I think they just exist. They're just part of the landscape. You honestly, unless you're looking for them, you don't usually see them. For me, the threshold, at least for this show's definition, is always intent. If a colony of giant ants devours a forest, there was no intention. There wasn't deforestation. It was just eating. At the risk of opening a can of worms, like there isn't any thought behind it. They have to be a little bit malicious in order to be a monster and they're not, they're just hungry or they want to take care of the colony. They're either hungry or responsible. If you are a DM who wants to center like a um, monster for an early level party around a giant insect, you can make it sort of this scary movie type creature, you know, where, where they have to go into the cave and slay the one spider that they know is, it kills everybody that goes in there. And so you can create this sort of living legend monster in the, in the minds of the characters, but they themselves are walking into where the spider lives. It's not like the spider is going out and catching people. There are ways to narratively get your characters to think that that thing is a monster. But if you take a step back, you're like, wait a second. If you cut and paste the spider and just replace it with a bear, you know, it's the same story and it makes sense, but we get that. So we sympathize with a bear far more. It's another mammal. It's got way more of a face going on and we can kind of grasp the intentions. It'll also change its habits. Would a spider change their habits like a bear would? Like if human food was available, a bear will change and become basically a different creature almost. Mm -hmm. Would a spider do the same thing? You can keep spiders in captivity, it's like um, like tarantulas and- But does their nature ever really change? Like, do they ever become more placid or more- Could you take a tarantula in like a big, big old fucking terrarium and have live insects getting in there versus like putting it in a, a giant pin 
uh, or a pen, like, scritching it and handing it clearly already dead stuff. Like, does it shift? Uh, that's that's an interesting question, and I don't think anyone is qualified. I don't think to anyone knows it. that. Yeah. Uh, nor has anyone asked it because why would they? It's a ridiculous <laughs> thought. But around, here's here's my my grand look behind the veil for science in general. Half of science is someone asking what is nominally a, an idiotic question. That's the part I'd be really helpful with. Like a question that does not warrant asking. And then somebody goes like, we could find out. And then we just go forward. And then eventually halfway through doing it, you're like, you know what? We could use this actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, if I was a scientist, I'd be great at all the idiot questions. I'd be number one. You would be very good at questions. <laughs> How would you change giant insects in D&D? I have a lot of changes uh, that I want to oh, make. Yeah, it's a big question this time around. <laughs> uh, we already talked about the ecology missing, you know, throw some behaviors and some environments in there so we know where they live, what, what they like to do, you know? Give them a description at all. Yeah, so we can role play them. Like, this is a role playing game. Basically, I have issue with the poison condition in general across all of the, the giant insects that are that can cause poison. They can also cause paralysis, but it has to be from if they drop to zero hit points from the poison damage. Like, that's stupid. If they're getting poisoned, they should just be paralyzed. Also, just the number of bugs, they, like, they don't inject you with poison. They inject you with digestive enzymes. Yeah, that's gross, too. Flies literally spit digestive enzymes on things when they land. That's how they eat it. They let it dissolve and then they suck up the goop. You could put a giant fly in and have it deal massive acid damage after it grapples you. Yeah, just absorbing whole kobolds. I have an issue with the different senses, so like vision and senses. I think that scorpions should have tremor sense. Um, especially if they lay down on their bellies, you know, like in the desert, and you can see them sort of wiggle their bellies into the sand, and they are feeling for vibrations through the ground and where their prey is so that they can run after them and eat them, sting them and eat them. So I think that they should have blind sight, tremor sense, some something that gives them an advantage in their terrain, because, you know, they live in that environment. It makes sense for them to be adapted to that environment, not just like... I can't see in this cave that I live in because it's dark and I can't see in the dark. That doesn't make any sense. Treat the insects right. You're basically telling them about the environment too. And it should meet together. They should have this like intertwined connection that then makes that world feel so much more real. And that is, also, it makes them different. Like if the scorpion has a tremor sense and has a blind sight, then it's a slightly different threat than this other large insect, where as, where, as opposed to the usual issue D&D runs into, they all just become a different type of bear. It's all just claw, claw, bite. And it's nice to have these abilities, which makes them interesting. Claw, claw, sting. Yeah. If you're going back to the spider in particular, um, a lot of the artwork that you see in the monster manual in the player's handbook regarding spiders, they show them as these like bald, shiny creatures. Spiders have hairs on them. They use them to sense their environment. They can feel changes in, in pressure and direction of the wind and and they can sense what's around them through these little sensory hairs all over their body. But none of the pictures, I'm sorry artists out there, none of the artwork that I've seen shows spiders as hairy, like the little jumping spiders are hairy. I wanna see hairy spiders. Tarantulas use hair as a weapon, as a defensive maneuver. I mean, there's so many things you could layer on that, again, that would make them more interesting characters. And also a fuzzy spider has a different feel. Yeah. You can do cute spiders. They're kind of cute, yeah. I've seen cute spiders, and there is nothing a party loves more than a cute creature. I also draw issue with the movement speed for a lot of them. Spiders need a jump. Like, they need a jump distance. They can jump, like, 10 to 20 times their body length. And so if you have a five by five foot spider, you know, not not that it's actually that big, but that's the area that it occupies, it should be able to freaking jump 50 feet from standstill. It doesn't even need to run. I've seen a spider take a moth. It tackles it. I've seen it, it basically jumps out, pounces on it, rolls on the ground. It has a charge or a tackle or a grapple. Absolutely. If you're fighting a colony of ants or you're fighting giant wasps, they should have pack tactics. They, you know, they are working together as a social group. They need to be able to 
uh, coordinate themselves in, in a group. So pack tactics for social insects makes sense, I think. Pack tactics, to me, is reflective of social dynamics in a way that makes a lot of human sense. You know, it, it shows people working together. But we think of bugs as swarming. Give pack tactics, but don't give advantage to hitting. Give additional damage. Once someone, once a bug starts attacking you, it encourages more bugs to join the fight, and it gets more dangerous. It's like that killer bees. Yeah, when a killer bee enters a bee nest, they'll just swarm it with their bodies and just use their body heat to just overwhelm it and smother it. Yeah, honeybees do that to defend against those hornets. You could get away with giving that like straight up pack tactics, just give it the advantage to hit. But like I said, for me at least, when I'm running these things, you want a dichotomy between animals and insects. You want them to feel a little bit more unnatural to just work a little bit different. So having it be that sort of thing where it just encourages more insects to group and swarm and kill, as opposed to two wolves, you see two dogs, and you can clearly tell that they're communicating between each other. These things, no, they're just more aggressive yeah, yeah. and more scary. Yeah, because I think pack tactics, it's sort of, you think of it as being like the help action, right? Like they are helping each other, they're distracting so that the next guy can hit. Exactly, yeah. Well, so yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily think that, that ants would be, they would more be into that swarming, I think. Like they're not necessarily trying to distract each other. They're all just trying to hop on the same target at the same time. They do what you should do in any martial arts movie. They swarm <laughs> all at once instead of waiting yeah. to fight you one at a time. We gotta watch everybody get beat up first before I go. buildings they're widely spaced it is a very poor use of space at a glance one building is very clearly uh, there's an entire section of it that's very very new and looking at it from above as we are you can see sort of the scorch marks around the building that justify the new construction in the middle of this ring of eight buildings is this really tall like looking from it above it legitimately looks like a button it's a circular tower with this glass dome on top of it, it's the library. We come in to someone wandering from the library at the center of the university out to, let's say the evocation building, out to that uh, semi-new, recently exploded building. Aram, you want to tell me about our, uh, our student here? Fismoria Grayshield is a mountain dwarf wizard and this is not her university. She is here as a graduate student, following up on things she's learned at the Magic War College, which is where she normally goes to. But even in a war college, you've got electives. So she's here banging out some of the electives she has to do in order to get her war college stuff, which is what she's really interested in. You got thrown over here to like do a little bit of a research project that your supervisor was really into and he sent you to any vacation classes and just and i have to like do all these little spells on bugs and like see how they react and i write down all the reactions like you know cast this cantrip over and over on this bug and write down what the she's bored to death right now yeah, of course you're going to test it on bugs because like even the wizards have a certain level of like if you're going to make war magic, you still have to make sure you're just like killing people instead of like making horrendously torturous murder spells. The ethics committee. Listen, it's okay if this spell explodes their heads, but if they're racked with pain immediately previous to that, that's technically in the purview of the necromancy schools. There are extra forms to fill out for that. You are heading back to your your lab for the time being, not really your lab, the place where you've been holed up for the last little while. You had to do some quick cross-references, 
for some stuff that you were trying to look at, and you're heading back up. I'm always having to check out reagents, constantly. They're just penny pinchers on everything. It's so much harder to find everything because every, all of the books have been moved around. They cleared out the center, like, lobby of the of the library for this, like, kind of ar- pseudo-archaeological display. They've got a bunch of artifacts up. It, it's just the university showing off. They're trying to impress donors. It's like, just teach people, for Christ's sake. You're getting back in, you know, passing through the construction area. There's the pause of like, that is solid masonry. They're doing yeah, good work. Right, right, right. There was like, like, she would sub. She's like, hmm, yes, I do appreciate this fine cut stone as a dwarf. And then continue on. You have the stone cutting ability on the sheet, all right? And I did, I did pick, uh, I did think I did pick masonry. Like, yeah, this is your shtick. She would have come from like the typical mountain homeland where everyone had to know how to fix you know, one of the walls. You had to learn that. But there's an extra thing because they're getting people over from like the transmutation building and you can see clean lines where molten stone have been melded with the new stone and it's like actually a really clean join. You can't quite, it's very well done. There's some artistry here. They took shortcuts with magic, but okay, there's some artistry here. You're in this little sort of like third floor lab, you know, you're off near a window, you're overlooking a couple of farmers fields. The windows are always important in the evocation building because if something explodes, you need the wall to be able to give out. If it's just hard stone, then everyone inside will die. So tell me, what are you getting up to right now? I have returned with a bunch of reagents and this scorpion because now we're expanding our research into other things. So I have to spend like five minutes getting a little scorpion out of a bag and into a heated terrarium, which I don't understand. So that takes me like the majority of my focus is gonna be there right now. Part of the spell, one of the material components is a toxin that is similar to the scorpion's venom. And there's just a little bit of concern about a weird feedback loop happening if you target something. Evocation mumbo jumbo, just let me blow up the the weird stingy spider. I've gone through a lot of scorpions up to this point, frankly. <laughs> All right, Aram, I want you to roll me animal handling. All right, that is a three plus one is four. <laughs> So you're trying to, like, put this thing into the terrarium. They give it to you in, like, legitimately a little plastic bag. The trouble is, this is on, like, a second tier shelf on the back of the desk, like, behind the desk part, and you are a dwarf. Right. Nothing is sized for me here. I've got stools all around this place. This is a human lab that mostly work like, it collaborates a bunch with one of the elven colleges. They're not expecting you here. This university is not ADA compliant. All dwarf access has not been provided here. So you're like way overreaching, like, and you're trying to get this thing out. And as it's falling out of the bag, turns and pinches. It grabs, it is trying to not fall. And you stumble, like you grab just right in that little, like the webbing between the thumb and the finger. Oh, it's the worst. You go to stumble back. You thought you could reach, so you didn't grab the stool. You're like half on the desk. You catch the edge of the thing. You go to grab and you grab wrong. The moment you touch it, you feel the smooth kind of cool sides of a gemstone. And immediately your brain rushes like, fuck, what was on the desk? What could this possibly be? And then you start falling and you continue falling and you continue falling for what feels like. At some point I would cast a feather fall because I do have that. Just as a reaction pops off and you start drifting down and it was all running on reaction. It's all adrenaline. And you suddenly realize gemstone. Fuck. There are a couple of weird like apparatuses. They have really, really small parts. And so the easiest way to do it is to just reduce size effectively like three or four times, getting down to like maybe an inch tall and just enter in and move the screws around. That's the bit you grabbed and you watch it clatter onto the ground and it lands and there's the momentary like 
this is something Jesse will be able to attest to. When you knock something over in the lab, the first thought is not danger, it's, oh, did I break something expensive? It's true. Clinks onto the ground, and everything is okay. And then you realize that you have fallen off the desk, and you are falling into the middle of your lab at about an inch tall. Right, just watching the desk get further and further away as I both fall and shrink. Oh, like one of those like zoom and pan back moments in the in the yeah. Yeah, yep, exactly. exactly. I bet that's how it would. I bet that's how it would feel because your vision is getting smaller, things are getting larger, but you're also falling and pulling away. So the already too through too tall, like three foot high desk is just. I mean, proportionally, it's gone from you know, chest level to what, like 40 times your height? Towering over me. As you slowly and delicately touch down. Steady myself, take a second to breathe, take in my surroundings, and then I would do like a mental inventory, like, oh crap, what do I have, for, what do I have ready? Because it's the first thing any wizard would think, like, what am I, what am I capable of doing in this moment? Cause I can't adjust. So where have I got myself to right now? And that's what I would spend like a couple seconds doing. You run through your quick inventory and it's like not anything immediate, nothing that will immediately solve the problem. Right. Right. A few useful tricks. You've got like, there's some stuff up your sleeves. And then you look over to like the shelf next to the door where you dropped off your cloak and spell book oh, no. on your way in. Right, so I've got what I've got, but I can't even get to the book. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I could get enlarged. There's a whole bunch of spells. There's like probably a dispel magic in there. Like there's stuff I could do, but I don't have that prepared. I have other spells ready. There's even like a scroll case on the side of like, hey, if a spell gets out of control, there's like a quick anti-magic field that'll just like perfuse the room. The wizard's fire extinguisher. Break glass, dispel magic. If you do that, you will get yelled at later. Because it'll inert everything. Yeah. Everything in that place is ruined. Everything magical is going to be inert, but mm -hmm. you'll stop an apocalypse or whatever. Yeah, exactly. They had to get installed after, you know, the South Wing. This has been my favorite part of running this in the Nothic, because I'm just slowly in like installing all of the shit that I want to complain about, about being a scientist. Academia, too. I love it. I have to get up on that desk and somehow get that crystal back. Otherwise, it's like running under the door and trying to find help, and that just seems really dangerous in this size. I have to solve this now myself. Especially, as previously mentioned, in the evocation building, where you're never sure if somebody's gonna, like, cast a poisonous cloud that's gonna, like, leak out the bottom side of the door. The floor is the worst place to be in this building. I mean, these are all wizarding students. None of them are going to be paying attention where they're walking. Absolutely no nerd is ever looking where they're walking. Reading their books as they go. Listen, listeners, you all know you're all the same. <laughs> <laughs> looking at the desk, one of the major problems is this was one of the nice pieces. So this has got like the long sort of like beveled leg where it like fluctuates. It's clearly cylindrical. It gets wider and then it gets thinner and then there's the little ridge thingy. Right. That's going to make it harder. That is an unclimbable surface, basically. It is an unclimbable surface. You could maybe, but there's just a lot of places where you would basically be climbing back out. Right. And just too many places where you could fall. The best angle of approach, and I'm saying this is a DM who is always open to being contradicted, would basically be to get above the desk and drop down onto it. She has to levitate prepared, probably because this is a, it's a human sized room, but it was built by elves and no one is less accommodating than elves. They're just God, the no. worst. Especially high elves. Yeah, and they have that thing like the French Acadians have where every single piece of written thing is also has to be an elvish. So there's two labels on every single thing. Yeah. Hey, leave the Quebecois alone. They're all right. So I use levitate frequently because there's just some stuff I've got to reach in it. And I'm a student right now. I can spend a second level spell slot on levitate. Yeah, it's no I'm big getting deal. Books. Yeah. In your undergrad, that would have been uh, like inexcusable waste of resources. Grad school, I can pull this one. It's fine. 
Okay, so you got a plan in mind. But at first I gotta get there. Exactly. There's a weird familiarity to it. Like you lived near a mountain and the thing about mountains is they tend to have deserts near them, right? It's like if you're approaching from the western side, there's a whole bunch of sand leading up to this very, very tall thing. It's it's a kind of canonical image in your head, except now the very, very tall thing is not a mountain where your city is. It's a desk. Everything's much more visual now. Like even I imagine the wooden floor, the grooves in it are now start out like almost steps. Like everything is just a lot more tactile and obvious around me right now. But that desert, like you can see where you dumped the terrarium onto the desk. And you can see the glass hanging out above you where like, man, if that had fallen, it would have fallen after you. And this day would have gone so much worse. Instead, there's just this constant little trickle of sand falling down like an hourglass and gathering and pooling in front of me on the ground. So you see effectively a desert stretching out in front of you. I'm trying to do all this math in my head. I'm going to give you the distances in feet so that you can like thank you gauge. Yes. But I want it noted that this is a pain in the ass because now I'm trying <laughs> to like do a conversion. <laughs> You're like a foot away from the desk, right? Yeah. Like laterally. But proportionally, that's 12 times your height. Right. So you're looking at something in the 60 to 70 foot range, proportionally. It'd be a long walk around this desert. I'm going to have to go through this desert to get to the... To, yeah. Yeah. All right. She would just steady herself. I mean, she has faced bigger trials than this. That's how she got here in the first place. This is just one more thing in her way. And she strides forward. Right now, you are effectively climbing a small mountain yeah. of sand. Like, you're climbing a, a massive sand dune because it's poured down. I've done that, and it sucks. I hate sand. It's the worst. It's coarse. It gets everywhere. Aram, what I want you to do is basically give me a constitution save. We're going to put it at a 12. Uh, this is your endurance check. Okay. I have a plus three. That is going to be a 17 plus 3 is 20. You've fucking done this shit before. They gave you a mule to like carry your shit, but you didn't fucking need it. No self-respecting dwarf takes a mule. No, we carry our own bags. Riding animals? Come on. Use your legs, humans. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Jesse, at any point, if you want to jump in there. I'm going to hop back to those boots under the desk. Yeah. Can we say one of them is tipped over? Because I think the scorpion would be hiding in there. As if it fell off the desk, it would immediately look for somewhere to hide. And it saw this hole. Just immediately scuttles into a cave. Yeah. It scurried into the cave. Yep. And I'm not even thinking about the fact that I haven't seen the scorpion. Mm -hmm. uh, my mind's not there. So I wouldn't even have registered that. And of course, the boots are on their side because these were left here clearly by a student, which means that they walked in and they just sort of kicked them off and there's no respect paid to the space. Oh my God, they're Uggs too. You know they're Uggs. These are wizard Uggs. Ye old Uggs. <laughs> <laughs> it's Uggs with an E at the end of it. <laughs> It's a pain in the ass. There are some times where your foot slips under you and you have to catch yourself. But if anything, this is easier than last time because it's not even really hot sand. It's in the middle of a regular ass room. Also, because I am a researcher, I've got mold earth as a cantrip. So I can make it a little easier as I'm going through, at least. It's still like giving a little under you. It's hard to walk up, but you're fine. And as yeah. you're starting to get near like the proper slope, when you're starting to get near the top, right to where you could get up, that's when your head is poking up. And from the boot, you see movement. Squint. And also in the boot, you see movement. So I've just like crawled on top of this hill. Yep. And I see the boot moving, but I don't know what's moving. It settles down. You know, it was upright and then it settled. Like hunched a little bit. You see a hunch. I'll keep an eye on it, but I'll continue moving. I have no choice. I mean, the faster I do this, the faster I'm not small. That's fair. That's fair. Ish. Relatively. You, normal size. We'll say normal size. You know, she's actually like four foot three. She's tall. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Four foot five in heels. 
<laughs> Thank God you're not wearing them today. Didn't expect the sand. <laughs> Jesse, you just see this little creature just scaling a mountain. There was presumably like a short period of like recollecting yourself after a big ass drop. But that's the nice thing about being a bug is I could drop you out of a plane and you're fine. I just fell from from a great height, but uh, it didn't hurt. I landed on uh, on my legs fine. Uh, sand started pouring down on top of me, so I moved over a little bit to the side to let the sand pour down, and it started mounding. And I looked over and I saw this dark cave. It's bright in here. I don't like how bright it is, so I immediately ran to the cave, turned around to face the opening so that nothing could surprise me from the entrance, and I settled down into put put my belly on the ground and my my claws out in front of me, my pincers. I don't know if they're called claws. Maybe let's call them claws. Uh, put my claws out in front of me, and and my stingers is hovering, is curled up on my back, and I am uh, just watching right now to see what the environment is like before I decide to explore it. Um, it's a big space that I'm not used to being in. I'm used to being in a in a small space in a tank with cool little things I can hide under, um, and this is a a very large arena that I've never seen before. And I imagine I would see this little creature climbing this sand mound that is pouring down and think maybe it was a test of some kind. Somebody has been testing me this last last few weeks and maybe it's something I'm supposed to do. So once I figure out that nothing is going to attack me, I've been in here for however long it's taken you to climb up to the top of this mound. I've been watching you. I can feel you with my belly on the ground. I can feel your steps. I can feel the sand pouring down. I am going to wait. I'm going to crawl forward, you know, like a cat stalking something, really low on the ground. Wait till you turn your back and then speed towards you. I want opposed stealth and perception. Okay, opposed stealth and perception. So my stealth is going to be... Nope, nope. You're on the wrong end of that. It's the scorpion sting. Yep. Right. No, you're right. My perception. My perception is going to be one plus one is two. Here's how I think that happens. I get up on top of the mound. I see something move in the boot. It causes me to stop for a moment and I don't realize how much that would cause me to sink. And then I panic and the sand gets in my eyes and I flip all around and by the time I'm finally combobulated, there's no more movement and I don't know what's happened. I love that you've gone for the antonym of discombobulated. <laughs> in that flurry of sand being thrown up, um, I'm gonna scurry out of the boot and sort of strafe around in a sideways uh, motion to try to get lateral to her so that I'm out of the periphery, but not quite behind her, if possible. I mean, natural one, you have no problem doing that. I rolled a 17, but stealth is stealth is uh, dex, right? So it'd be 18, yeah. You are specifically built to move on sand. So this is something where you are just dead sure-footed. You know where you're going. Rom, when, when you kind of get your shit together a little bit, you're still a little ways out from the top. Are you trying to get as close as possible, or do you think you have an idea of how you can float over? I mean, I could, like, leap off, cast Levitate, and use the momentum, I suppose, as my running leap to, like, carry me. I could do that, but I don't think she's that far yet. And also, it's risky, because if I just float past it, I've missed it, like... If you're under and you have to, like, drag yourself back along the top of the table. And I also I can't slow down. No, she's just going to continue forward and just try and get as close to the table leg as possible and then cast Levitate and go up. Watching the boot the whole time, approaching with her eyes locked on that boot. And that 18 is going to ride and your passive perception is definitely not 18. Mm -hmm. Jesse. Yeah, I'm going to come in from the side like a, like a T maneuver and um, make a attack. Yeah, I'm going to say you've got surprise on this one, so you can make that roll at advantage. Oh, man, I'm going to need it. With my claws, going to be a f 10. Is that with the advantage, or...? Yeah, I rolled a 2 and a 6. 
the corner of my eye at the last second, I just saw a glint off of that claw and it just gave me enough time. It's not even a dodge, it's just letting yourself slip and roll down the hill. Scorpions obviously have a texture to them, but they're too small for us to see it. But I'm sure a good chunk of the listeners have seen like crab shell or like a lobster or something like that. This now looks thick and hard. Like this isn't a bug anymore. This is a tank that has come at you. Terrifying. Scorpions get multi-attack. Can I take my second attack? Yes, of course. Uh, 15 with my second claw. That would normally hit me. Mm -hmm. But so as your claws coming down and just about to go for my throat, a little magical field of energy pops up and just deflects you at the last second. So you're going to have to say the words, I cast shield. On my reaction, I cast shield and therefore what would have hit me does not. Yeah. Listeners need to know what's happening. That's fair. We are playing a game. Yes, I understand. And my third attack, my stinger is going to try to poke where you were. But I don't have a reaction left. So that plus five lasts until the end of the round, though. Oh, I rolled a four. So it's an eight to hit. You lucky bastard. I'm very lucky. Just on my back, scooting away. The claw hits and sort of goes off. And then you get the full slam over the back. The actual stinger hits and slides down into the sand. The stinger is nowhere near you, but because it slid along the shield, the cloud of sand that it kicks up goes straight up into your face. Really emphasizes how fucking close that was. Also, it stings a bit because now this is hitting like gravel. It is your turn. Out of panic, I would say she would do a gust. So she's going to cast a cantrip, which is gust to blow all the sand in its face off of her. And then she's just going to scramble backwards and try and run for that chair leg. I don't know what Gus does off the top of my head. You seize the air. Give me the mechanical shit. I don't care. Okay, so I think I'm blowing the sand then. I'd have to blow the sand onto them. Then, yeah, you basically obfuscate. uh, We're going to say that's going to last the round. Okay. We're basically just going to give this scorpion disadvantage. I have blind sight. That's true. Oh, you done bad, Aram. <laughs> but in character, though, it's a perfect reaction. It's what I would do to get away. I've been trained. This is almost reaction. Like, you're trained. If you go on your back, you just throw the dirt into your opponent's eyes and, and get back on your feet. That's Mage Warcasting 101. Uh, that being said, if you're still moving back, Jesse gets an attack of opportunity. It's going to be a claw attack. Going to try to grapple the creature the target first and then sting them yeah and so that one two three was the usual motion that it takes to subdue a prey so i gotta start over uh an eight i'm rolling garbage with this i roll out of the way as one of those claws just slam next to my head now it's the monster's turn so i have now moved movement speed which because of because the boots i'm wearing is 30 feet from you so i have moved 30 feet away 30 proportional feet, which is about half a foot. Right. (laughs) Yes, correct. Did you, are you hovering already? Are you uh, levitating? No, I'm running. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm just full out booking it. And I'm fast for a dwarf, surprisingly fast. My, My striding and springing seems to have elongated as I run. I think the scorpion is, uh, has a speed of 40 feet. So it's going to try to get in front of you and then turn around to face you again and puff up and make itself big. Uh, poise the stinger ab- above its head and just challenge you to see what you're going to do next. I don't think it's going to attack you this round. It's going to wait to see what you do. It's going to prepare to try to grapple you if you run away again. There's that camera shot where it's like rotating around us and I'm just looking over its shoulder just past the stinger and I can see the edge of the desk right there and then just move and clap their hands together shouting as loud as they can and they're going to cast thunder clap 
and create a burst of thunderous sound that can be heard up to 100 feet away. Each creature within range other than you must succeed at a constitution saving throw or take 1d6 thunder damage. And DC 10, uh, 12, sorry. I got a 14. And you take no damage from it. You just feel this wave of intense sound pass over your shell. That would be quite startling, I think. Yeah. For a creature that you that has spiracles that breathe through holes on its body, if this sudden rush of wind came at it, it would almost have to catch its breath for a moment. I think that would be quite startling. Yeah. And I try and run past it. Is this enough that you think a scorpion would basically judge this as not worth it? Yeah, I think it would try to make one more attack as you were going by. But with that sort of stumble, it might be like a little bit more ill-aimed, like it wouldn't be able to target you as well. Let's give this one disadvantage, because as you mentioned, you know, that that spell legitimately targets a weak point of the monster. So it feels like you should get like something for, you know, being a little clever. Oh, yeah. 23 to hit with the claw. Yep, that'll definitely hit 100%. Uh, So it's five bludgeoning damage and you are grappled in my claw. <laughs> An eight with my stinger. Oh, luckily enough, no, it does not hit. In, in mage war training, you have to simulate a lot of things. And one of the things we did is we had this large magical rope that would just wrap around you and you had to fight your way out of it. So I've actually trained in this. You are a wizard fighter. You are specifically trained to fight problems wizard wizards cause. Grabbed by giant claw of arthropod is actually not a weird circumstance for you. <laughs> it's in the handbook, page 32. Right, it fits in. Jesse, you can make one claw attack, I'm going to say, because the other claw obviously is occupied with holding them. Oh, nat one. <laughs> what we're going to do with that nat one then is, Aram, I'm going to give you a chance to escape. You can make the athletics check to get out of this one. Uh, that's going to be a four plus 12. That'd be a total of 16. Then you pull it off. Like this, this thing goes to like... Yeah, they're not meant to do that. And so when they came in with the second one, they kind of let go with the first one. And I was able just to slide out and drop as they both slammed above me. It is your turn. The gust didn't work. The thunderclap did seem to work. So I think as soon as she drops down, she just slam her hands together right underneath it. So roll a DC constitution save of 12. Uh, 12. I see it almost lift you up a little bit, right? But still, your armor is so tough, it just absorbs it. Well, now you're coming from under it. So like the major effect was sort of the gust fucking with the the weird breathy pores, which (laughs) there's a science name for, but I am a physicist. The breathy pores. Breathy pores. Spiracles. We all have uh, them. Yeah. <laughs> I, got the, I got the big one that all my noises come out of. Yeah. But yeah, it was the gust of wind over the spiracles that really had the effect. So doing it from under it is actually accomplishing nothing. Right. It's just a hard force impact distributed against the thing's chest, for lack of a better word. And then once again, I turned and run. We're going to say that you are you, you're at the leg, basically. So on my next turn, I can cast Levitate, but not this one. Yep, because you decided you were going to try to spite hit the scorpion. It worked last time. No, it worked last time. It distracted it. I was able to get away, so... Yeah, but also, if you just took the attack of opportunity and floated up... I think if you have a giant (laughs) crab over you, you're not really thinking that far ahead. You're being reasonable. I'm just saying it would have worked better for you to just escape. (laughs) No, when though when they when they get there and they realize, yes, if I had just used my action economy better, I could levitate now, sure. Yeah, you fuckwit. I know when I'm going about my day, I consider action economy, okay? <laughs> She's running full speed and just turns and lets her back slam into it as she slides along the little remnants of sand with her fists up. I don't think the scorpion would bother with you anymore after this multiple attempts of trying to get you and sting you and just getting pushed with this force. It doesn't hurt, but it feels like one of those tests, right? Like it's 
it's not succeeding. And so at this point, like, it doesn't know what it has to do to continue, that I think it would just go back to the boot. It would be, it would be like, okay, you know, you're down the mound now. I'm probably at the top of the mound looking down at you. I'm probably just going to slink back into the boot, but like strafing to not take my, my, the front of my claws and my face away from you. Same. My little, my little fists are balled up and I'm just turning and watching you the whole time until you're back in that boot. Because we didn't really deal any damage to each other. It was. It seemed to be like an even match. Yeah. If I'm putting it in like a weird scorpion term, our claws are evenly sized. I met yeah. a match that I'm just like, you know what? It's not worth it. Big sigh. Thank Clang and Dang Silverbeard. Cross myself <laughs> or whatever. And you then begin guys. to levitate upwards. Levitate lets you rise at a speed of 20 feet per round. Uh, which purport, I'm calling basically our conversion rate is uh, one to five, basically. Okay. So like you're going up about four inches around. One space is now one inch instead of five feet. Gotcha. So it's going to take you about nine rounds to get to the top of the tower. Round it off. It's going to be a full minute of you just drifting vaguely upwards. <laughs> I'd settle in, but we are getting proportionately very high in the air. Yeah. Uh, again, you've floated upwards for a full minute, which would be 200 feet. I'm a mountain dwarf. I'm sure this isn't that bad. I'm sure I've trained for it. But still, yeah. a lot of things are going on. I'm at the edge of tents, I would say, at all times. You are floating up and you're fine with it. But at the same time, you're used to doing this with your feet on something. Right. Yeah. And that's where that discomfort comes in. So after a full minute of drift, you're like just close enough to be able like, do you have like a war hammer or like a maul or something? I don't like, have any weapons on me. I was a student. Why would I have a weapon on me? That is that is a fair statement. Do you have anything that you could use to grab the table and just drag yourself over because levitate gives you no abilities of lateral movement? Or is this a drop the spell and sort of jump? Nope. I'm wearing a cloak. So what I think I would do is basically, you know, whip off the uh, whip off the cloak, fold it over until it's got some thickness and then just wave it back and forth like I'm trying to <laughs> fan a fire until it pushes me over to the desk. It takes longer than it should, like just long enough to reinforce how ridiculous this idea is, but it absolutely gets it done. <laughs> I probably spin in a circle a few times before I could even get any momentum. You have to sort of hit a stride. Yeah. It's like rowing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you eventually get it where your foot's close enough and then you get your foot and then your once your foot makes gets purchased, you can kind of drag yourself over and then you can drop the spell. What I'm going to say is for the first time in Kill Every Monster history is you can, if you would like, take a short rest. <laughs> Really? Because <laughs> I know you have that arcane recovery thing, and yeah. I want you to be able to, like, get your spell slots back, because I know you burned, like, two first-level spells or something like that. Yeah, totally. Three, actually. Okay, yeah, you know what? She will get up on that desk. She will sit down with her legs kind of hanging over, which is very familiar to how she used to sit on this one ledge back in her mountaintop home. And she'd just take a deep breath, and she'd center Ooh. herself... She'd feel familiar. Her, yeah, yeah, exactly. Her little legs, yeah, just, you know, just kind of swinging <laughs> back and forth over the edge. For the benefit of the listener, they've done a gesture where they have their two fingers extended downwards and then they wiggle them like someone yeah. kicking their legs. Yeah. yeah. That was, that's what that was. <laughs> yeah. And then I would just like, you know, I, I, I would go through, we would do these breathing exercises up in the mountains early in the morning when the sun was first rising and the dew was, was you know, still on the stone. She would do these breathing exercises. She would calm herself and regain her spell slots because that's how relaxation works. Yep. <laughs> I am going to also roll one of my hit die. And that means I heal back six points of damage. So I am back at full. Oh, not bad, not bad. You know, she takes some time, bandages herself, rips a piece of, the, oh, she can't, it's, 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 it's a magical a cloak, rips a piece of something, bandages, you know, bandages herself up and she's good to go. Honestly, there's probably just some loose parchment on the desk. <laughs> she like looks at it and like, oh, I can't rip these notes. And she pushes them aside <laughs> and grabs a different one. <laughs> In case of emergency. Yeah, that's a, that'll do. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's fine. You take your break. 
you know, there's a breather. There's a little bit of collecting yourself. And like you said, sitting on this ledge overlooking the little desert, there's almost that voice in your head that's like, if I planned this, this would have been kind and nice. It would have been fun. It would have been a neat, ad- yeah, it would have been a neat adventure, but sadly not. So fortunately, you happen to know that on the far side of this desk is a, a quick little dispel magic scroll. Probably be a pain in the ass to read it, but like you can you can get to it. That's one of the things is like you you never and this was one of the things I told you in your first lab course back in undergrad. You never cast a spell without the counter spell nearby. That's this right. Is basic lab safety. Yep. You don't have acids without a base on hand. So if I can just get that scroll open and read it, I'm good to go. So there's a bit of a hike getting wide around the terrarium that you're trying to put the scorpion in and that little bit and like looking a lot oh i'm going like okay it didn't break that's fine that's fine. i'll just get that back when i'm done sweep up the sweep up the sand that's expensive that's fine okay good okay good cool cool it's when you get to the far side and you're met with a glass wall and you look at it and it's another knocked over jar from what is it that you see that signals what jar this is because as you mentioned you know you've been using you know insects and shrunken things as like test subjects basically so you have like you have an inventory effectively i would walk up to it and put a hand on it kind of look left and right to see which is the easiest way to get around it and as i look left and it's catching the light i notice this rainbow sheen in the glass that the other glass doesn't have. And that is the coating we put on it to keep them from being able just to phase right through the glass. The second I see that rainbow coating, I'm like, oh no, because I know exactly what's happened. And I start looking around. The moment you see that, you start looking up because you know where the top of the jar should be because this was legitimately just Getting a purpose-made terrarium was too expensive. You got a standard issue twist top jar coated. We would just make this magical paint, basically. This magical, yeah. clear, lead-based paint and just paint these things on. And you can see the break in the jar where the lid cracked off. My heart just goes cold. It can't read the Dispel Magic scroll. It is still proportionally like your size, but also it's not turned into a full size phase spider, which is the sort of thing that would get you fired. Right. Yes. But it'd be less of a problem for me right now because there's no way it's going to pay attention to me. Oh, if it was regular sized? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would just go after everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. It would just ignore me and attack, attack the other students. The point is it won't be my problem anymore, Dylan. As someone who works in a lab, if I open the door and there's a phase spider in my entire lab. You're gonna close the door. You're fucking fired. Visiting scholar rights revoked. <laughs> Back to the mountains. <laughs> we're not we're not taking any more students from that school. I am basically back against this glass, edging around it with the shortest path to where to where I'm gonna have to break off and then just make an open a sprint across the desk to the to the dispel magic a scroll. But right now I'm just like on my own back against the jar, edging around it. So you have some training to you. You know, you're a war caster. What item do you repurpose as a physical weapon? You were surprised by the scorpion, but you are realizing that there is a problem right now. So I want to know what your war hammer is. It's not gonna be a weapon because I'm a war caster, but I had a snake in here last week we're doing some larger experiments and there's still a couple large scales flecked off on the ground so i grab a piece of metal i grab one of those scales i slam the two things together cast mending to wield it even though that's not what mending does it's not but it's cool enough we're going (laughs) with it (laughs) and i lift up my emerald shining shield and i get ready to run across that gap plus two daisy standard shield awesome Jesse, you got disturbed. You've been trapped in a jar. They have been very, very cautious. Every once in a while, there's 
there's a sense, right? Like, this is a creature that can teleport, that can jump through the ethereal. So when they shut it down, when they feed you, there is a moment where there's they seem to look at a piece of parchment, and then you can't feel it anymore. And then the jar opens and the food comes in, and they're always very careful, like, knock you back in, and shut it back. This didn't happen. There was a sudden cacophony. The world shifted around a little bit. And then the seal broke, and your senses extended. Back to the full room. And I want to know where you went, what you've been up to for the last couple of minutes. I think immediately I would have gone ethereal. You know, phased out and wandered in that barrier between here and there to avoid being spotted or squished or preyed upon in any way. So I'm using my ethereal jaunt. I would like to get up on the bottom of something so that I can look down. So is there like a in and out tray on this desk? <laughs> <laughs> The way this desk was shut, set up was like with those shelves in the back end. So you can absolutely yeah. get up sort of on the bottom side of that shelving unit. Just kind of back into the shadows just above, you know, a handful of notebooks that were supposed to be put away and you have been reminded several times. So I am on the, on the underside of the in tray. Um, and once I'm in the shadows, I'll probably phase back into this, um, into this realm. Nobody knows. Nobody's around. Nobody knows that I've escaped yet. So I'm probably going to see what I can make of this. Um, the world is a lot bigger than I remember. Originally, when I was when I was a younger spider, I was the big thing, and the world was a lot smaller. So it's a little bit juxtaposed here, and I'm feeling vulnerable. But I'm hoping that maybe I can get back to that feeling of power. What I'm going to have you do, Jesse, is give me a stealth check. God, why do I roll so many fours? You'd have advantage on this. Do I? You okay. definitely have advantage Thank on this. Yeah, I'm gonna absolutely. Go with on this. One of my base rules is that if the person who is being, like, the, if the person who is getting the short end of the stick is offering the stick. So I roll the six. All right, so even with the advantage. Okay, so that's a 12, which does technically beat your, it meets your passive perception. So you are going to have to roll a perception to be able to potentially notice. All right, I only have a plus one. Four plus one is five. I do not notice. Quite frankly, what it might just be is you are looking around knowing that you're after a phase spider. Right, it could be anywhere. Yeah, it could be anywhere. And mostly it could be in the ethereal. So you're like watching for like subtle variations in the way the air moves you're like you're expecting it to be around any corner what you're not expecting is it for just to be for it just to be up in a corner in a dark bit but my training would kick in so i'd panic and look around and then she'd realize she oh i got it and she'd cast detect magic and she'd start scanning every like walking forward and scanning around her do I emit a magical sense when I'm in the material realm? That's the question. So the, the problem is detect magic is a wildly ill-defined spell. Mm -hmm. Like strictly speaking, it detects auras. Now does spell casting only cause an aura when the spell is being cast? Does it only cause an aura when this effect is active? The only real instructions we have about auras is how they relate to magic items. So we're going to kind of make it up. Uh, what I'm going to say is this is going to let you use Arcana as perception. Cool. Basically, I'm going to let you make a perception check using your Arcana skill because the phase spider would absolutely be causing some weird disruptions that a trained eye could notice. Does that sound fair to everybody? It's also under a weird magical effect that's so mm -hmm. small right now. That's yeah. Oh, shit. That's also true. I hadn't considered you could be looking for the transmutation effect. Oh, yeah. Because that's, I think, what I'd be looking for. That's a fucking good call. Uh, yeah, make the roll. 19 plus 4 is 23. You kind of swing left to right, and it's like, okay, everything seems fine. And you're about to dismiss it, but part of that is like an upward gesture, and you just catch that ping. A little sort of purplish, like the color of transmutation. Slowly move my hand up as I rise and look upwards. 
you know what? This is going to be one of the weirder calls I make as a DM this year. Jesse, you want to make an insight check for the phase spider? <laughs> sure. I love this. Oh, I rolled well. Insight. Uh, so 17 plus zero, 17. Yeah. yeah. And you absolutely like this thing is making motions, whatever. It's it's just gesturing around. It means nothing to you. And then it, its hand drifts towards you. And that seems fine. But then its hand sticks and it looks. And there is something in the back of your little spider brain, wherever that lives. I assume still in the head. I don't know what spider biology is like. <laughs> Who gives a shit? Spiders aren't real. Uh, <laughs> the spider sense is in the butt. That's where it is, Dylan. We firmly established yeah. this. Okay, so yeah, your butt tingles. You are being observed. You know this thing is looking directly at you. I'm used to this feeling. People pick my jar up all the time. Yeah. You're well back in the shadows. You should be ob fully obscured. You should be safe. But you know, you absolutely know that it is staring directly at you. I think I would phase back into the ethereal. That's a bonus action. It pings with a new color. Right. You're getting conjuration now for motion between planes. Cool. And then maybe drop down and scurry toward it. Flip over. Now you'll add all those cool sound effects, I'm sure. You get that flash of conjuration magic once it steps into the ethereal, and then all of a sudden, it is a fucking blur of motion. And then it's just this weird little sea of colors because there is no physical substance behind it. There is no natural light coming off of it anymore. It just surges towards you, and this is where we're going to roll for initiative. <laughs> My initiative is plus four, which gives me uh, a one plus four is five. Because this is so scary. I got a 10 plus two, 12. Yeah, this is going to the spider. You literally got the drop on me. Uh, all right, Jesse, you're up. You cannot attack while in the ethereal. You're technically on a different plane of existence. You can't interact like that. So I'll have to use my bonus action to phase back in. Well, you know that I have run towards you, but for any other creature, it would have appeared as though I teleported because I was up there and now I'm directly in front of you and I'm going to try to bite you <laughs> for a five. Oh, <laughs> though the shield comes up and just those teeth just, just bounce right off it as I get that shield up just in time. The fangs slam into the a shield. She blocks them. She stands up. She looks you right in your many eyes. And the slightest smirk comes off her face as her fingers begin to twirl and kind of like make like a circular ball motion as she weaves a web to try and <laughs> capture it in. The irony. <laughs> Aram, as you start casting the spell, I want you to make me a nature check. Okay, sure. Absolutely. That is going to be a two plus two is four. Cool. So you cast a spell. Uh, Jesse, uh, you have the trait web walker as the uh, phase spider. You are unrestricted by webs. Well, their own webs. Let's read that carefully. It says caused by webbing. Oh, damn it. Okay, yeah. fair. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Drat, 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 drat. Okay. I love this. This is great. This is like this this city girl who just doesn't know about nature. Doesn't know. Who's like, right. yeah, this will work. <laughs> this will be fine. And I have heard that spiders can be trapped in other yeah. in other people's webs. So I thought I was being super clever yeah. here. Mm -hmm. Like I enjoyed this little like, oh, I'm all of my knowledge will defeat you. <laughs> yes. It'll defeat you in such an ironic way. So many books I've read. You have no idea. Yeah. Well, you know, when you're being consumed, wrapped in webbing, you can tell the spider how fucking clever you were <laughs> <laughs> for now uh do you have like a bonus action or anything you want to pull uh no i think she would just be start like like she would cast it it would wrap around it and see that it's instantly ineffective and just be startled and just keep running for that dispel magic a scroll and just keep invoking attacks of opportunity okay you got an attack of opportunity <laughs> go for it jesse you got an attack and then you've got your turn proper um so that'll be a 12 Okay, 12 is not going to hit me right now because I've got the shield. Fortunately, whew, just, just duck that one as a cloth sails over my head. And I'm going to run after you and try to bite you. All right, so that'll be a 19 to hit. That is going to hit, sadly. Sadly, I'm in favor of Even it. Even if I cast another shield, that would still hit. 
Um, so you take uh, five piercing damage, and you have to make a yeah. DC 11 con save. Right, and then a con save. Which fortunately, I am a dwarf. Oh, so yeah. That's going to be a one plus three is four. And the second roll is going to be a 17 plus three is 20. Okay, so you're going to take half <laughs> damage from the poison. 12, 14, so you take seven. Still, that yeah, hurts. That's a, that's a hell of a hit. That hurts a lot. Yeah, I can feel it coursing through my veins. Like, it still just feels like fire inside me, but it doesn't take me down. Basically, if this thing sort of extended its legs all the way up, it's basically like 10 feet tall. So this is, it is on top of you, teeth buried into your back. Jesse, are you staying in the material? Yeah, good question. I don't think, I don't think it would. I think it would probably phase back out and, and uh, see what happens. Yeah, because she flips around ready to cast Burning Hands and you're not there. Mm Mm-hmm. Aram, what I want you to do is give me a constitution save. You're going to roll with disadvantage because I didn't make you make it last time. I think it's just DC okay. 10 because you didn't take enough damage to up the DC. Natural 20. Uh, you are rolling at disadvantage. The disadvantage roll will be an 18. Okay, cool. Yeah, so your detect magic is still up. So when it disappears, it's like it literally no longer exists on right. the material plane. So there is that those teeth in your back and they don't even pull out. They just cease to be there. But I still know roughly where it is. And the moment you, yeah, the moment you wheel around, you've still got that aura. You can still see that mixture of colors as this thing is being tiny on a different plane. Run, run away, full speed. Full dash, uh, you get, I'm going to say you can go fast enough that you are going to get to the scroll. Yeah, because I have 60 feet of movement now with my little boots. You have one foot of movement. Right, <laughs> correct. <laughs> I'm going to sprint those two feet. Man. No, one foot. That's that's the full. Oh, oh, oh together? Yeah. Okay, fine. The full move is a whole foot. foot. <laughs> Do I get another opportunity attack? No, because you're not in the ethereal. You're in right, the ethereal right, right now. Okay. You can't hit him. Still got me pretty good. <laughs> I'm not. I mean, there is blood coming out of my back. I am not looking great right now. Jesse, it is your turn, though. Uh, I'm going to say Fismoria can get all the way to the scroll, but you use your action to dash, right? So you can't cast the spell. Right, exactly. How, how far did you get? 60 feet. So this would be your full move to get there, but you could get there. Yeah, I can't attack when I get there, but I will pop back in to the material plane so that you can see me. As soon as I get to the scroll, yeah, it's just like... <laughs> <laughs> so you get there and you're immediately like at the edge of the scroll, like you're going to go start to read and then you hear it. Because again, when it's on the ethereal, it makes no noise. And then suddenly there is a 10 foot beast right on your ass looming there it like it yeah. is now like the sizes are proportional so that it does hiss it is an audible noise right fucking behind like a you rattling hiss yeah. right she would look up and see this thing just towering over her and the first instinct would be just a burning hands you're standing on a scroll, yeah. <laughs> Made out of paper, so I can't do that. So I think what they're going to do instead is just get ready to take the hit and start reading the scroll. I'm trying to run around and read a giant scroll. I mean, I've got Invoke an Attack of Opportunity. You have to unroll it, probably move 10 feet. Yeah, right. Her full 60-foot move speed now amounts to one foot, and she has to read the entire page from top to bottom. The attack of opportunity happens. That's my ruling. Do you want to explain the scroll unrolling? <laughs> I'm going to say it's just prepped. I've got stones on it, holding it open. That's, again, after the explosion, there are some safety guidelines that were put in place, and there has to be an accessible dispel magic in the room if lab work is being conducted. I'm spending that time crawling on top of like an inkwell, like a closed inkwell pot to get the height I need to be able to look down and read the (laughs) scroll. Okay, so while she's unrolling the scroll, um, my opportunity attack is a 12. To hit. Oh, that's gonna miss, fortunately. That is just gonna miss. 
The spider is immediately on top of you, and Aram, the last thing I want from you is an arcana check for precision magic. Absolutely. That seems fair. That's going to be a four plus 18 is 22. Oh, There's one thing she can do well. It's science under pressure. <laughs> She's a grad student after all. You start casting the spell. And you're trying to like, honestly, there are contingencies. This isn't a normal, like standard issue to spell magic. This isn't a full blown, like this isn't the complete anti-magic field button you got on the wall over there, but this is still modified. It's a safety precaution. So you work and you feel it grab the transmutation effect. The, the effect from that gem that makes things small. Success. And you feel it like a string in the weave. Snap. And your perspective shifts. You trip. There's a little bit of a stumble. You were standing on the edge of a desk. So, you know, just kind of pick yourself up. Collect yourself. Wipe myself down. Very pleased. Like this was a, I wanted something exciting to happen and something exciting happened. I had a fun little adventure and I am rather pleased with myself. You did so good. And then you hear a very recently familiar sound, a rattling hiss. And you recognize that dispel magic effect. It is an area of effect. It is right. in a range and immediately behind you is a 10 foot tall, actual 10 foot tall phase spider. Fully grown phase spider. Not going back in the jar this time. <laughs> <laughs> and out muffled just a little bit in the hallway. Anybody walking by could hear the mumbled, ah, oh, fuck. For more information about us, notes for each episode, and ways you can help support the show, head over to killeverymonster.com. If any of the ideas we've discussed on the show have sparked some of your own, tell us about it on Twitter at KEM Podcast. You'll find me at DJ Malenfant and Aram at Aram Vardian. For ad-free episodes, early releases, bonus episodes, print-ready maps, our new audio DMs notes, and my character sheets for each encounter, head over to patreon.com slash killeverymonster. You can also listen to ad-free episodes and bonus content by subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts. Our intro theme and many of the sound effects you hear in the show were created by Battle Bards. Check them out at battlebards.com. This episode was produced by Aram Vartian and Dylan Malenfant. I also did the editing. Our guest for this episode was Jesse Dehan. You can find them online at Just Jesse D. And if you are anything like me and all of that information just fell right out of your head, you'll find everything you need at killeverymonster.com. And we'll see you next time for Kill Every Monster. Monster.